Stephanie, a lot of people want to know not just when the Fed will start to tighten policy, but how aggressive it will be in doing so and how prolonged this rate tightening cycle could potentially be. Yeah, and I think that the, the, the fact that we're not really sure about the answer to that question and, and that certainly that investors are not really sure about the answer to that question, we saw play out in the volatility in the markets this week. I think one way I think about it is, you know, we've had an era of gradual but limited rate rises being the only thing that was ever on the horizon. You know, that was the era of forward guidance. And uh, we know that now, and I think markets particularly after this week's uh, press conference, know this is a slightly different Fed, a different regime. What we don't know is whether we're losing both the gradual and the limited, or we're just going to be going a little bit faster but still have a relatively modest tightening cycle. And I think that's what people are playing with. You know, have we got, even if we saw quite, uh, quite a few rate rises, I mean, now the market is coming around to the idea we might have five rate rises in the US mm -hmm. uh, this year. There's this feeling that, OK, that means they won't have to do so much later on because we're still talking about a relatively modest bit of tightening. But if that limited piece has already also gone, that we're not, the Fed's not just going to be gradual and not gradual, but also going to do a bit more tightening than the market was expecting previously, well, that does potentially mean that all bets are off. What do you make of Powell's comments about the idea that the Fed see, needs to be nimble? On the surface, that obviously makes sense, but that seemed to also spook the markets to a certain degree. Yeah, I think it's because if you think about where we are, um, you know, being nimble can feels like it can only really go one way. It can only be in a hawkish direction because in the past we've come to the we've actually come round to the view that the Fed would tie its hands with forward guidance and allow it not uh, put itself in a position where it's reacting to every bit of uh, data as it comes along. It specifically promised the financial markets and everybody else, you know, we're going to hold rates low, even when inflation is, is, you know, reaching the target, we're going to hold it even longer than that, because that's what our new strategy implies, that we're going to err on the side of having too much inflation. Trouble is, once you have too much inflation by the Fed's own higher hurdle, and you've reached that tipping point where you really need to tighten, well, that new framework doesn't say anything about the pace of tightening. It doesn't say that that's going to be any slower than in the olden days. And in fact, it might mean that you have to move that much faster because you've left it too long. What do you make of some of the criticism out there from folks like Bill Dudley, Larry Summers, of course, a contributor to this program, uh, John Waldron over at Goldman Sachs, a lot of uh, rel relatively prominent people I guess a little bit concerned that not only did the Fed not move as fast as they wanted to see, but maybe they're not getting the communication as clearly as they would like to see right now out of the Fed. Yeah, and I think there's a, there's a fundamental point here, and I've actually had this conversation uh, with Bill and actually with Larry. It's whether we've changed, uh, where, have the balance of risk changed from what we've seen in all the years since the global financial crisis? In all those years, you'll remember when we talked about, you know, central banks facing tough decisions, it was always the feeling that you err on the side of being too loose, that the bigger risk was that you would send the economy back into recession or that the bigger risk was that inflation would be too low. Mm. I think what Bill Dudley and the likes of Larry Summers are thinking is that, you know, the Fed still has that frame on what it needs to do when actually the risks now are on the other side. Actually, the risks to the broader economy, not mm. just to inflation, are greater if we are seen to let inflation get out of control. And that's the, that's the danger of being behind the curve as they see it, which I think is also, you know, there's some sympathy among, among other commentators and even among members of the FOMC with that view. There is also, I guess, a, a question sort of baked into all this about whether the economy and, to, for that matter, the markets can sort of stand on their own without this sort of extreme accommodation that we've come to expect out of the Fed and from other central banks around the world. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, we have got used to running the economy and the markets together. What's good for the economy is good for the markets. And of course, there's been many years where the markets have done a lot better than the economy in the last few years. Certainly in the years after the global financial crisis, it was part of that era of super loose monetary support for the economy that you had super performance from the financial markets, even when the economy was quite flat. I think we are moving to a world, and certainly the Fed probably would like to see us being in a world where actually the economy looks a bit healthier than the financial markets. And I think that was also the sort of what was rippling through financial markets this week was the feeling that, hang on, the Fed doesn't seem to care about us as much as, as, much as it did before. And I think if you, the response for the Fed is, well, because the economy is growing really strongly mm -hmm. and inflation is really high, we don't have to worry about you. 
you do, you, you and your team do a lot of great work at Bloomberg Economics and sort of tracking uh, economic growth and tracking all the elements that go into that. When you look at some of the most recent data that we've gotten, including the latest GDP numbers from the fourth quarter, the, the rise in the employment costs index, uh, as well as some of the personal and consumer spending trends here, does that suggest to you a healthy economy? Well, I think when you look at a lot of the data, including uh, you know the very the latest bit of data we had on the employment cost index, which is something that the Fed looks at very closely. You know, when our uh, chief U.S. economist Anna Wong looks at that, and she spent many years at the Fed, she sees a, a green light to uh, at least five interest rate rises, and even the possibility that you will see that 50 basis point rise on the first time out, which. Uh, had been discounted because we know the Federal Reserves hadn't previously felt that that was warranted. Uh, if you just stripping away, if you just look at wages and salaries, that is growing at a rate which is consistent with inflation still being well above target, well over 3% by the end of this year. And that's on the Fed's own measures. So I think most of this data did confirm what I was saying earlier, which is, you know, you have a strong economy and you have inflation, which is clearly for some time been exceeding all the targets uh, that, that the Fed has ever set itself um, for a prolonged period, you know, this, this does set the tone for quite a lot of nimble rate rises. Mm. Look a little bit more globally for us, because if the Fed does embark on this tightening cycle, as most people expect them to do, you have a European central bank that, at least for right now, appears to be willing to stand pat. You have a Chinese central bank that is now appearing to actually become more accommodative. And you have other central banks around the world, lesser central banks around the world, that don't necessarily all seem to be on the same page as to which direction they want to take monetary policy. Does that matter? Yeah, and you've mentioned actually the most interesting uh, difference out there at the moment is that difference between the People's Bank of China and the Federal Reserve, which we have not seen in, in living memory. Uh, the PBOC being able to go in a different direction from the Fed because it's kind of freed itself from having to follow every step uh, that the Fed takes. The Chinese economy has been weakening and the PBOC is, is weakening policy uh, to, to support that. Uh, it's not doing very much for Chinese financial markets, but the, the, the Chinese authorities are not, don't mind so much about that. But it does, it does provide a sort of counter force to what the Fed's doing. And actually, an interesting uh, thought for investors who've had so many years of the U.S. outperforming other stock markets. You know, I was quite struck by the European stock market uh, actually holding up pretty well this week, despite all the volatility in the U.S. You know, there's many, many years where people have said this is the year where Europe um, finally uh, does better than the U.S. Well, maybe this year, this will be one of those years, but maybe still not a very high return. Yeah, it could potentially be. And, of course, a lot of that will depend on uh, whether policymakers, I guess, get in the way uh, of that progress. Uh, let's circle back then to the overhanging issue, which is inflation, Stephanie, and the idea that there are some elements of these inflationary pressures that may indeed prove to be transitory. And that is also raising questions as to whether we do need some sort of aggressive monetary policy tightening. Well, I think uh, there's lots of different pieces of that, right? I mean, we have, we do think there's some prolonged supply chain issues, though some companies are able to get around them. We saw the Apple results today somehow miraculously uh, getting past some of the supply chain issues that have, that have dogged other big uh, multinationals. But if you look, um, if you look more broadly, you know, it's not just the sort of the normal suspects, if you like, pushing up prices. You know, I mentioned before wages and salaries picking up at a fastest rate than they have in, in many years. You're seeing, you know, services costs, not just in those areas that are just opening up in the economy, but more broadly picking up. So I think it's hard to argue now that this is an inflation which is just coming from key bits of the economy. I think the place where that's most true, in fact, is the Eurozone, where energy has been a big part of the price rises so far, and actually we're going to see more uh, coming down the track. But in most other countries, certainly places like the UK, where the Bank of England's already raised interest mm -hmm. rates, this is fairly broad based. We may not be going into a high inflation era, but this is definitely not something that's just going to be a prolonged blip. 